On July 4th, 1954, the murder of Marilyn Shepard made headlines in Cleveland. The victim's husband, Dr. Sam Shepard, gave police this account of what happened. I believe it was sometime after 12.30 a.m. that Marilyn tried to wake me. I had fallen asleep on the living room couch. I think she asked me to come up to bed. The next thing I knew, Marilyn was screaming or moaning my name. I jumped off the couch and ran upstairs. I thought I saw a white form standing in our bedroom. Then I think I was struck from behind and knocked out. When I came to, I went over to where Marilyn was. I felt she was gone. I believe I then rushed into our son Chip's room. After seeing him, I came to the conclusion he was unharmed. As I came out of Chip's room, I thought I heard a noise downstairs. I spotted a figure near the outside door, and I chased it down the path toward the beach. I tackled this individual from behind. Then I felt as if I had been twisted or choked. That's all I remember. The next thing I knew, I staggered to my feet in the water. Somehow I made it back up the stairs. I guess I thought I would wake up and find it was all a horrible dream. All I know is that eventually, I somehow realized this was real. Three months later, Cleveland newspapers published news of Sam Shepard's trial for murder. Since the day of the murder, the news media have published and broadcast both news and opinions about the case. This is their right under the First and Fourteenth Amendments of the Bill of Rights, which guarantee freedom of speech and of the press. But the Bill of Rights also guarantees in the 6th and 14th Amendments that a person accused of a serious crime shall have a trial by an impartial jury with due process of law. In the Shepard case, the rights of the press and the rights of the accused are destined to meet in a head-on collision. Meanwhile, all of Cleveland awaits an answer to the question that has gone unanswered for three months who, in the early morning hours of July 4th, murdered Marilyn Shepard. Was it her husband, Sam Shepard, as the state charges? Or was it a mysterious, bushy-haired intruder, as claimed by Dr. Shepard? The uncertainty had begun on the day of the murder. Police... Searching the Shepherd house and grounds, failed to find the murder weapon. Investigators do find signs of an attempted burglary, but they suspect that Shepherd has committed the murder himself and staged a burglary as a cover-up. Sam Shepherd is taken by his brother to the Bayview Osteopathic Hospital, which is operated by Dr. Richard A. Shepherd, Sam's father. Shepard is questioned by police while in the hospital. One investigator flatly accuses him of the murder. Noted criminal lawyer William Corrigan is retained by the Shepard family to protect Sam's interests. Accompanied by a police guard, Sam leaves the hospital to attend his wife's funeral. With no charges formally pressed against him, Dr. Shepard returns to his practice. Growing impatient, the Cleveland Press runs an editorial urging police to take action against the prime suspect. Four days later, 
A front page editorial increases pressure on the police. The following day, the press devotes most of its front page to the case. An editorial addressed directly to the county coroner, Dr. Gerber, urges an immediate inquest. The next day, an inquest begins. To accommodate the crowds, the inquest is held in the gymnasium of a local high school. Newspaper reports are extensive. Shepard is questioned about a romantic involvement with another woman. He denies the inference. On the last day of the inquest, Shepard's lawyer is removed for objecting to the circus atmosphere of the proceedings. The next day, the woman linked to Shepard is brought to Cleveland by police. Her story will prove that Shepard lied under oath. Shepard will later claim he lied to protect her reputation. Four days later, Shepard is arrested. is indicted by a grand jury and ordered to stand trial. In mid-October, the trial begins in a barrage of publicity. Presiding is Judge Edward Blythen, who is running for re-election to the bench next month. Chief Prosecutor is John Mayen, also a candidate in the coming elections. Shepard's lawyer, William Corrigan, asks for a postponement and change of venue, saying it is impossible for Shepard to get a fair trial in Cleveland. Judge Blythen withholds ruling on the motion, says the trial will go on if the attempt to select a jury is successful. In ten days, a jury is selected and the trial begins. The jurors are not kept in seclusion, but are allowed to go home at the end of each session. Perhaps they read newspaper articles like this one, which suggest that if Marilyn could speak, she would name Sam as her slayer. The trial, with the state building its case solely on circumstantial evidence, continues for nine weeks. Newspapers headline Coroner Gerber's theory that the murder weapon was a surgical instrument. This theory, never proved but widely publicized, is damaging to Dr. Shepard. Witnesses for both sides are photographed and interviewed freely by newsmen. Rumors and gossip, not admissible in court, are published. In the November elections, both Prosecutor Mayen and Judge Blythen win. By now, everyone associated with the case has become a celebrity in Cleveland. Uh, would you tell us your impression of Dr. Sam? Well, of course, it's always very difficult to give uh, a full impression of a defendant when you've only heard his voice really once. Uh, uh, he hasn't testified yet at his own trial. It's expected that he will. And I can only judge him from the very external externals. Uh, he's extremely good-looking. I think he's better-looking in the flesh than he is in his pictures. I've been asked by friends when I've gone back to New York what he's really like and who he really looks like, and I'd say that in profile he greatly resembles Marlon Brando, and in full face he reminds me of Henry Fonda. Why, uh, the man is completely unemotional. He says that someone came into the house while he was sleeping on a downstairs couch and that that someone killed his wife and twice knocked him unconscious. <laughs>
He has no idea what time this took place. Uh, he does not know how long he was unconscious on either occasion. The uh, state says that his motive for murder was his love for another woman. That he wanted to get rid of his wife so he could marry this other woman. Uh, until the defense has had an opportunity to attempt to refute this, uh, we must conclude that the state has made out uh, what the jury could accept as motive. Finally, the case goes to the jury. sworn do find the defendant Sammy Shepard not guilty of murder in the first degree, but guilty of murder in the second degree. James C. Bird Foreman. On the day of the verdict, Cleveland newspapers print thousands of extra copies, sell them all. A defense motion for a new trial is denied. Judge Blythen contends the publicity surrounding the trial did not violate the rights of the defendant. The Cleveland Press runs a final editorial. Six months after his conviction, Shepard is transferred from the county jail. Since the trial, his mother has taken her own life. His father has succumbed to illness. Now, Shepard begins his life sentence as prisoner number 98860 in the Ohio State Penitentiary. In prison, Shepard meets regularly with his family and lawyers. Many appeals are made for a new trial, but they are all denied. Six years pass. Finally, in 1961, the Shepard family hires a young Boston lawyer, F. Lee Bailey, to continue their efforts to free Sam. I read the trial record and I met Dr. Sam and I felt that he was innocent. It just didn't seem right to let an innocent man languish away in prison without even trying to get him out. We filed what is called a petition for a writ of habeas corpus, which asks that he be released because his constitutional rights had been violated. And it came on before federal judge Carl A. Weinman in southern Ohio. Some of the things that he found to be constitutional defects in that trial included a lot of pretrial publicity that he thought was most unfair and probably preconditioned the jurors. He found that the judge who heard the case was a prejudiced man, had not been fair to Sam at all, and furthermore, that he didn't keep control of his courtroom, that newsmen were bouncing up and down like jacks in the box and taking pictures of jurors and kibitzing and making noise and destroying what we like to think is the decorum of a criminal trial. On these grounds, he termed the Shepard conviction a mockery of justice and released him in $10,000 bail pending action by the state. Yeah. Briefly describe your recent experience in the Ohio penitentiary, what it was like there for you. It was hell. Who do you think is most responsible for the what you consider to be the unjust decision in 1954? Well, I would say uh, politics, probably. Uh, now, the, the, the decision name names, would you like to? I think that... Well, I, I think in view of the fact that we anticipate litigation here and that Sam will be a party to it, it's probably best if questions of that sort are directed to me. I think that we can answer your question by reading from Judge Weinman's opinion that the newspapers generally and the Cleveland press in particular was horribly prejudicial before and during the trial to the extent that it would have been impossible to assemble a fair jury under any conditions. How much does it cost you? Ten years. Or oh, in money, sir. Because money could not possibly repay me for my mother's life. How much would it cost to bring her back? 
my father. My father-in-law. A few days after his release, Shepard marries Ariane Tevin Johans, a German girl who had begun a correspondence with him while he was in prison. On a trip to New York, they are mobbed by newsmen. Mr. Shepard, how do you decide you're in love with a man who's in prison? Um, well, that's why I came to the States, to find out if I really was in love, because you couldn't tell by somebody you have never met. I don't and uh, how many meetings did it take before you did decide? Uh, it was the first moment I walked into the visiting room. How does freedom feel to you, sir? Ecstatic. Mr. Bailey, how can a man be in jail 10 years and uh, just now be proven innocent or be released from jail? Because our system has some serious flaws in it. Well, how do you explain his conviction in the first place? Uh, it was a result, according to Judge Weinman, and in my opinion, of mass hysteria generated by an overzealous press. Uh, was politics involved in this in any way? Well, it was to the extent that the elected officials who had something to do with Sam's conviction uh, were very zealous to get public approval of their actions. Were you in on the case at the beginning? No, I've only been a lawyer for four years. He's been in jail for ten. Okay. Almost a year later, the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit ruled by a two-to-one majority that Judge Weinman had been wrong, that Sam should not have been let out of jail, and that his so-called constitutional violations were not really that serious after all. I was able to persuade the court to leave Sam Shepard out on bond while we went to the United States Supreme Court. I felt that the issues were large enough and serious enough and applied to enough defendants in enough cases so that that court would want to decide the case and that if it did decide the case, it would do so favorably to Dr. Sam. In the winter of 1965, the United States Supreme Court hears the case. Bailey presents the arguments for Shepard. Arguing the case for the state of Ohio is William Saxby, Attorney General of Ohio. We argued that uh, even though the publicity had been bad, that the jury had not been prejudiced, that they were a normal jury, that the trial was conducted by the judge in an orderly manner, that the judge was impartial, and that the uh, conviction uh, was a fair conviction. In other words, that uh, Sam Shepard had been been. Uh, found guilty by a jury that this jury system was not perfect, but it was the best means ever devised by man to determine guilt and innocence. The Supreme Court weighs both arguments. Meanwhile, controversy over the case continues. Well, the, the paper did not play prosecutor, in my opinion. The, uh, the paper did uh, respond to the uh, thoughts of a good number of people in the community, of a good number of uh, law enforcement agencies in the community. What was that thought? To the effect that uh, this was a case in which uh, uh, police activity was not being carried out in the degree to which it would have been carried out had the individuals in the case been less prominently placed in the community. It's pretty hard for one voice to overcome millions of voices represented by the circulation of huge newspapers, of course. I believe the page one editorials came about after uh, a good number of people in the community, uh, a good number of people uh, um, outside of this community even, uh, some uh, law enforcement people in this community got the idea, the thought, uh, right or wrong, that uh, an attempt was being made by certain individuals to, in the vernacular, uh, cover up uh, what had happened in the Shepherd home on the morning of July 4th, 1954. As I look back and as Ariane straightened out my thinking a little bit on this, I couldn't blame people in, for instance, New York or Chicago for taking and uh, respecting the wire releases from Cleveland because they're used to this and they didn't have any basis of disbelief until some of the men and women came to the trial, and people like Paul Holmes, Dorothy Kilgallen, many others, a lot of local people, news people, television people, realized what a phony thing it was and how I was absolutely uh, not proven guilty and railroaded. And, and what, it wasn't until this happened 
that uh, some objectivity entered the picture of uh, news media. And it was too late by then. Twice before, the Supreme Court has refused to review the Shepard conviction. Now, in 1966, 12 years after the trial, the court hands down a 29-page unanimous decision with one justice abstaining. Here are portions of that decision. Bearing in mind the massive pre-trial publicity, the judge should have adopted stricter rules governing the use of the courtroom by newsmen. Secondly, the court should have insulated the witnesses. All the newspapers apparently interviewed prospective witnesses at will and in many cases disclosed their testimony. Thirdly, the court should have made some efforts to control the release of leads, information, and gossip to the press from police officers and the counsel for both sides. Much of the information thus disclosed was inaccurate, leading to groundless rumor and confusion. In addition, reporters who wrote or broadcasted prejudicial stories could have been warned of the impropriety of publishing material not introduced in the proceedings. In this manner, Shepard's right to a trial free from outside interference would have been given added protection without corresponding curtailment of the news media. The Shepard jurors were allowed to go their separate ways outside of the courtroom without adequate directions not to listen to anything concerning the case. Moreover, the jurors were thrust into the role of celebrities by the judge's failure to insulate them from reporters and photographers. The numerous pictures of the jurors, with their addresses, exposed them to expressions of opinion from both cranks and friends. Where there is a reasonable likelihood that prejudicial news prior to a trial will prevent a fair trial, the judge should continue the case until the threat abates or transfer it to another county not so permeated with publicity. Since the state trial judge did not fulfill his duties to protect Shepard from the inherently prejudicial publicity which saturated the courtroom, the case is remanded to the district court with instructions to order that Shepard be released from custody unless the state puts him to his charges again within a reasonable time. It is so ordered. Four months later, a retrial is held in the same building where Shepard was found guilty 12 years before. Once again, the state seeks to prove him guilty of murder. F. Lee Bailey defends Shepard. This time, the attitude of the court reflects the new Supreme Court ruling. In order to conduct this trial, I deem it's necessary that there be no cameras, or sound equipment of any sort on the second floor of the courthouse nor the third floor of the courthouse. This will be journalized and any violation thereof will be considered a contempt of court and handled accordingly. The trial lasts three weeks. The jury deliberates eight hours. Sam Shepard is found not guilty. Okay, guys, clear out. He jumped almost before they said it. Look where almost before, was Hey, Sam. Let's get the hell out of the way. Give him a chance. And from the top of the courthouse, a group of uh, female inmates in the jail there shouting encouragement, cheering. Sam Shepard and his wife, Ariane. Found not guilty by a jury of seven men and five women. Uh... In the end, Sam Shepard's victory proved limited. The murder of his wife, Marilyn, remained unsolved and a matter of continuing controversy. His second wife sued for divorce less than three years later. Yet out of these unhappy events, something of value was gained. Following the Supreme Court rulings, both the press and the bar adopted new rules controlling publicity in criminal cases. Are you kidding? Freedom of the press and the right to a fair trial, both essential in a free society, were now more equally protected. What's your reaction right now? Your client's not guilty. Uh, give us your thoughts, please. 
My reaction is that the system has paid off. Does that mean you won't seek any further payment by way of moral claim for 10 years in prison? It means nothing of the sort. This was a criminal charge. The defendant's been found not guilty, and I think that's what he should have been found. You're going to seek compensation from the state for the 10 years by way of moral claim? Well, if it is improper to publicize a criminal case before trial, it's equally improper to publicize a civil case. <laughs> Come on, watch that camera. <laughs> My leg. Get off oh, my foot. Get off my foot. All right. Hey, Dr. Sam, carry on. Turn around here. Give me a picture, will you? Get the beard. 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 Get the beard.